Good morning, everyone. Uh, we are getting ready to start. We're one minute late. Um, so if you can settle in, and then we'll ask the plenary and panelists to step up on their stage. <clears throat> Great. As we wait for everyone to arrive, I want to welcome you. Uh, my name is Youssef. For those who know me via email or behind the scenes on social media, uh, this is me <laughs> and, and the flesh. Um, we're really excited to have you. We're really thrilled. Um, one of the things uh, that really appreciate here in Dayton particularly and at SBHR as a conference uh, are the dialogue, which we can't help stop, <laughs> apparently. Um, it's really important for us to engage in conversations, and those conversations, we hope, uh, they cha to, to challenge each other as attendees at the conference, but more importantly, uh, to build relationships and collaboration. Over the last three years, I've had the privilege to coordinate or help coordinate the conference, and uh, we have so many uh, projects that came out of this. Uh, so it really means it means a lot to us. Um, I'm not going to take much time off the plenary's time, but I really want to send a shout out to our sponsors. And I want to highlight the collaboration this year in a partnership with Open Global Rights. Um, there's going to be a lot of opportunities to engage uh, with the co-director, Arch Pandya here. Um, so please take advantage of that. On Friday, for those who are staying in town, there's a concluding plenary. This is the first year we do that, and we hope we, we hope it'll be a success. But it won't be a success without you, all of you and your participation. If you're interested in uh, presenting again in some sort of a fashion through a plenary, uh, please uh, sign up on the sheet that's outside the door. And this uh, plenary will be, will be moderated uh, by Open Global Rights. Um, in your program, you should have all the information you need to survive the next three days. If I miss something, <laughs> let me know. Um, there's a section, the spread, that's called All You Need to Know, and I really tried to think of all you need to know, but I must have missed something, so let me know. I want to uh, thank uh, two exhibits that we have on display today, the Ferguson Voices, and uh, Ferguson Voices is one of the projects that actually started at SBHR in 2013, and it's led by Dr. Joel Pruce, who's one of our faculty members here at the University of Dayton. Uh, you will get to engage with the project um, in the exhibit section. Another exhibit that's also on display, it's a, a, visual, a vis, visual interpretation of the Facing Project that was conducted here at the University of Dayton, in the city of Dayton. The, uh, the art and design students took the project to a whole different level. So there are a lot of books that were designed and created by the students. Engage with those and have fun, and um, th there's that. I will uh, move on now to our plenary, introducing uh, Dr. Naomi Dianda, an associate uh, professor, or is Associate professor, assistant, assistant professor. Uh, there are things that I still miss. <laughs> um, and she will take it from here. Thank you. Good morning and welcome to our first plenary uh, on forced migration. Um, thank you all for being here this morning and bienvenidos. This plenary is actually going to be a little bit bilingual, so um, just so you know, we, we have an interpreter here, and so um, some things may be said bilingually, and please, English, Spanish, uh, feel free to also ask your questions if you'd like in English or Spanish. So what we will do, just the general format of the session, is uh, we'll do a first round of introductions of each of the speakers, and then we will uh, ask a couple of questions. I'll ask the questions kind of as a conversation. We're trying to start a conversation here on the stage, but we're also trying to start a conversation with all of you. So we ask you to engage these questions as well and think about them because after the first two questions, we'll actually have a round of question and answers. Um, and then we'll come back again and do a third round of questions and then a small round of question and answers. And then we'll finish off with one concluding thought from each of the panelists. So just so you know, to keep on task. The other thing, I'm not sure if you have mentioned this, if you will silence your cell phones. And just to let you know, I'm going to keep looking at my cell phone, but that's because it's the only watch I have and I need to keep time to keep us all on task. So. <laughs> Just so you know, I'm not Snapchatting. <laughs> Where? Excuse me? 
Oh, okay. Well, you, some people uh, are tweeting, but tweeter. I will not. <laughs> um, so let me introduce, I'm just going to introduce the panelists by name, and then I'll allow them to introduce themselves and a little bit more of the work that they do. Dylan Corbett is the executive director of the Hope Border Institute. Ramon Marquez Vega is the director of La 72 um, of Home and Refugees. And as a day, Shashahani is legal and advocacy director of Project South. So I guess we can just start with Dylan and go this way with the introduction. Sure. I, I didn't remember all that format, so you all have to help me. <laughs> I'll, I'll um, pass you along. <laughs> a pleasure to be with you. Uh, grateful for the invitation to the Human Rights Center and to the Mariners community for the invitation to, to, to be able to have this dialogue with you. I'm the executive director, as Naomi said, of the Hope Border Institute, El Instituto Fronterizo Esperanza. We're a binational organization. We work on both sides of the border. El Paso is on the border, and uh, we work in the communities of El Paso, Texas, and our sister city, of Ciudad Juarez, uh, which is in Chihuahua, uh, which is in Mexico, and then Las Cruces, New Mexico. So we actually stand on the, the border of three communities, New Mexico, Texas, and, uh, and Ciudad Juarez. We work on issues of education and advocacy. Um, we, uh, so a lot of our, our focus has been in the two and a half years that we've been around on issues of migration. And we're a faith-based organization, so we work with the local community, especially the Catholic community, um, to get Catholics uh, more engaged in the work of justice, uh, more engaged on issues like immigration. Um, yeah, so that's uh, what we do. Buenos días a todos y a todas. Mi nombre es Ramón Márquez y soy director de la 72, Hogar Refugio para Personas Migrantes en Tenosique, Tabasco, México. Good morning, everyone. My name is Ramón Márquez. I am the director of la 72 en Tabasco, México. Eh, estoy aquí para eh, traer la voz de las personas migrantes, las personas refugiadas que recibimos en la frontera sur de México. I am here to be the voice of the people, the immigrants, and the refugees from the city of Mexico. En nuestro proyecto es un proyecto católico, un proyecto franciscano. Our project is a Franciscan Catholic project. Desde abril del año 2011, cuando nacemos, hasta ahora hemos recibido, hemos atendido a más de 75,000 personas. Since April of 2011 that we were born, we have um, helped more than, ¿cuántas personas? 75,000 refugees. Eh, en esta introducción quiero compartir tres puntos muy rápidamente. In this introduction, I would like to point out three major points. El primero es la crítica situación que estamos viviendo en Centroamérica y en México. First one is the critical situation that we're living in Mexico and in the border. Honduras, Salvador, Guatemala es probablemente la región más violenta del mundo. Honduras, Salvador, and Guatemala is the worst ones. De 2010 a 2016, primero Honduras por cuatro años, luego El Salvador por dos años, fueron los países más violentos del mundo. From 2010 to 2016, Honduras was the worst one. And then after that, it was El Salvador. Mm -hmm. Two years after that. Mm -hmm. eh, nosotros decimos que la región hay una guerra eh, declarada, no reconocida y no visibilizada. We say that there is a declared war, not civil, and it's a serious declared war. Eh, parece que la violencia es una causa del desplazamiento forzado. Nosotros pensamos que es una consecuencia más. The violence there, we feel that it's another cause of what's going on. Muy importante que pensemos eh, la intervención que ha habido en la región durante décadas. In decades, we need to think about the intervention that there has been in those causes. Intervención política, económica, militar. Intervention of economical, military, Politica. and politics. Que ha sumido a la región eh, y ha impuesto un orden económico neoliberal de muerte. It has caused a political 
in the region. Sí. In the region, um, not just economically, but a very system that's neoliberal. Eh, ese es el gran problema que tenemos en la región y el gran problema de la crisis de derechos humanos. Ese sistema que elimina los derechos más fundamentales de esta población. That is the worst problem that we're having down there and because of this is what we need to work on. El segundo punto es el incremento de solicitantes de refugio en México. The second one is the refugees that are coming into Mexico. Del año 2013 al año 2017, el número de solicitantes de refugio se multiplicó por 14. From 2013 to 2017, it has duplicated the amount of refugees. Tercer punto de esta introducción. The third point about this introduction. Hay una trampa en la categorización entre las personas migrantes y refugiadas. There is a trap for the immigrants and the refugees. En su gran mayoría, estas personas eh, son víctimas eh, de una migración y de un desplazamiento forzado donde necesitan atención. The displacement of these immigrants and these refugees has been a forced one. Y necesitan todos y todas protección y respeto incondicional a sus derechos humanos. They need respect, unconditional respect and protection to all of them. Inconditionally. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Azad Shah Shahani. I'm the Gun Advocacy Director with Project South, um, and also I'm a past president of the National Lawyers Guild. Um, so, with the National Lawyers Guild, um, you know, the work that we do is um, in support of social justice movements. We were uh, founded in 1937, and since the beginning, um, we were um, basically we call ourselves the legal arm of the movement. So, in defense of social justice movements in the U.S. as, you know, we saw recently in Charlottesville. Um, and then also, you know, very much relevant to the focus of this panel, uh, we have been in solidarity with our comrades worldwide as they were basically fighting back against repression, oftentimes um, fighting back against the same regimes that the U.S. government was supporting, um, supporting and brought to power um, in many instances. And that support continues to today. Um, so, um, you know, we very much work um, in collaboration and in support of social justice movements in Honduras, in Palestine, um, in Yemen, Yemen, and all over the world. And I look forward to speaking more about that aspect of the work. But um, with Project South, we um, work also in support of social justice movements in the U.S. South and also in the global South. So um, as legal and advocacy director, I work uh, primarily uh, with immigrant, refugee, and Muslim communities. Um, so right now, especially in light of you know, all the attacks from the federal government um, targeting these communities, we are trying to build a legal and organizing infrastructure among Muslim, Middle Eastern, and South Asian communities in the South. Um, so we're basically going around and doing Know Your Rights, Defend Your Rights forums. Um, so not only for the community to be aware of their rights, but also equi equipping them with the tools and the skills that they need to mobilize and organize and be able to fight back and also know that they're not isolated, um, that there is a movement that's, that's growing. Uh, we also do a lot of work around detention, um, immigration detention, so the same, um, you know, the same communities um, you know, from Honduras and El Salvador and you know, Mexico basically fleeing the repression end up in Georgia in the immigration detention centers. Um, so we're documenting the conditions and trying to get um, these facilities shut down. And then um, we do some other work, but the last area I want to focus on is um, our effort to try to build sanctuary cities and sanctuary communities. Um, so basically trying to cut collaboration between ICE and local police, ICE Immigration and Customs Enforcement and local police. and so. Um, right now in Georgia, there are seven localities that um, basically have a form of a policy um, limiting their collaboration with ICE, which is huge. Um, you know, we're working in the South. It's you know, very difficult in terms of trying to advance anything on the pro-immigrant front. And so we're uh, extremely proud of this achievement and we hope to uh, continue to build on it to get um, other localities, not only in Georgia, but elsewhere in the South to also 
um, realized that it's such a disastrous idea to try to basically collaborate uh, closely with immigration officials. Thank you all. And uh, before we get into the different specifics of each question, uh, there are just a couple of things I'd like to share. First of all, it's estimated that one in every 113 people in the world is either a refugee or in asylum. And I think uh, our panelists can also speak to why that number is really a strong estimate. And then secondly, I'd also point out I'd like to point out the five principles that help guide the Catholic Church's approach to migration, uh, just to kind of lay the Catholic framework of what this looks like, and that there actually is quite a strong response from Catholic perspectives uh, all over the world. So the first one is that persons have the right to find opportunities in their homeland. All persons have the right to find in their own countries the economic, political, and social opportunities to live in dignity and achieve a full life through the use of their God-given gifts. In this context, work that provides a just living wage is a basic human need. So uh, starting with the fact that people have the right to stay and live where they have been born and where they would like to reside. Second, persons have the right to migrate to support themselves and their families the church recognizes that the, all the goods of the earth belong to all people. When persons cannot find employment in their country of origin to support themselves and their families, they have a right to find work elsewhere in order to survive. Sovereign nations should provide ways to accommodate this right. And, and so the Catholic Church supports a very, very strongly supports a right to migrate. Third, sovereign nations have the right to control their borders. The church recognizes the right of sovereign nations to control their territories, but rejects such control when it is exerted merely for the purpose of acquiring additional wealth. More powerful economic nations, which have the ability to protect and feed their residents, have a strong obligation to accommodate migration flows. And actually, I think that one needs to be interrogated quite a bit, but I'm not going into it today. Number four, refugees and asylum seekers should be afforded protection. Those who flee wars and persecution should be protected by the global community. This requires, at a minimum, that migrants have a right to claim refugee status without incarceration and to have their claims fully considered by a competent authority. And again, we're going to hear quite a bit about this fourth one today. And then number five, the human dignity and human rights of undocumented migrants should be respected. Regardless of their legal status, migrants, like all persons, possess inherent human dignity that should be respected. Often they are subject to punitive laws and harsh treatment by enforcement officers from both receiving and transit countries. Government policies that respect the basic human rights of the undocumented are necessary. Uh, and then one last thing, uh, a few weeks ago, Pope Francis, along with Caritas Internationales, launched the Share the Journey campaign. So if you're looking for further resources, that's a really great place to look, is the Share the Journey website. So let's move on then to our first round of questions. And so the first question is, what do you think is the role of US foreign policy in forced migration? And I'll just let you jump in as you wish in responding. So um, I think the US role in forced migration is huge. Um, in different parts of the world, the US for decades has been um, interfering and creating the conditions, basically forcing people to flee. Uh, in Latin America, as I'm sure you all are aware, um, you know, in the 70s and 80s, um, basically the US was um, supporting these dictatorial regimes. And, uh, but you know, it's not limited to Latin America. You know, I'm Iranian myself, and so I can tell you every Iranian, regardless of age, can clearly tell you about the 1953 CIA engineered coup that replaced the first democratically elected prime minister of Iran, uh, Mossadegh. And the reason was because he wanted to nationalize Iranian oil, basically take away foreign control 
U.S. and U.K. control over Iranian natural resources. And so um, the U.S., um, working very closely with the U.K., basically engineered a coup to replace him with um, the Shah, you know, a dictator. Um, and so you can argue that that act created the conditions and the circumstances that then led to a series of events, which you know, basically the phenomenon you have in Iran right now is um, people fleeing you know, in, in different ways. Um, you have um, you know, basically a brain drain. Um, you know, we don't have a war going on in Iran right now, but you know, the economic situation is not um, very conducive to, you know, especially the youth wanting to stay and in terms of you know, various other opportunities. Um, and again, you know, I think you can argue that you can trace the roots of that to that coup. Um, if Mossadegh had been allowed to govern um, you know, in a democratic regime, things may have been very different in Iran right now. Um, you know, and then tracing it back to very recent history in Honduras, um, in 2009, the coup happening not with you know, direct U.S. involvement, but you know, very much with tacit U.S. <laughs> support, as, um, as the media have discovered, you know, the emails and you know, the Hillary Clinton involvement in that is, is very clear. Um, and so we actually, a delegation from the National Lawyers Guild, um, we had the opportunity to go to Honduras um, in 2013 around the presidential elections and observe the conditions. Um, this is, you know, post-coup. Um, and so, you know, you could see there was an atmosphere of intimidation, especially for um, human rights activists, for labor rights activists. Actually, in the lead up to the elections, two human rights activists were murdered. And um, we had the opportunity, the honor, to meet with Berta Caceres, um, the indigenous human rights activist. And she basically showed us the list, the death list, um, that had been prepared by paramil paramilitary forces working very closely with the government. And she was on it. And so even at that time, she was living underground. Um, and as, as I'm sure you all know, um, you know she, she was murdered. Um, a couple of years ago by um, forces very closely aligned with the regime and who had been trained by the U.S. government. Um, and so, um, you know, you wish that the U.S. government was sort of acknowledging their role. We actually met with the U.S. ambassador um, talking about all the violence happening and directed at the human rights activists and labor rights activists. And she was, you know, she was saying, well, there's violence everywhere. There's violence generally. And then afterwards, after the elections, she made an announcement um, basically celebrating this festival of democracy, this um, you know, elections that was um, happening in an atmosphere of fraud and intimidation. That was her characterization of it. And then, as we all know, um, the U.S. support for the regime in Honduras has continued, creating the conditions, basically forcing human rights activists and labor rights activists to flee, and also the general population suffering from the violence. Um, at the hands of the regime and forces aligned with the regime. Um, and so that's, you know, not, again, not limited to Latin America in the Middle East just in the past decade. We have seen the U.S. Um, interfere and, and wage wars in various countries from Iraq to, um, to Libya to uh, Yemen as we speak currently supporting very much so the Saudi regime bombing people in Yemen. Um, and creating basically a humanitarian disaster in Yemen. To, um, to the threats of war against Iran, I mean, it's not theoretical, it's very real. The Trump regime could very much attack Iran. And I think um, you know, it's a cause for concern for all of us as human rights activists who do not want to see more people basically be forced to flee from their home countries. Um, I would, uh, Naomi, you started out with a reference to Catholic social teaching and sort of core to Catholic social teaching is looking at the root causes of different phenomena in justice. And I think that U.S. foreign policy from the perspective of border communities, U.S. foreign policy, um, or sometimes the lack of foreign policy, <laughs> um, there, there is one of those root causes. Um, and we see that every day uh, in places like El Paso. So. Uh, in El Paso, there are multiple detention centers. You might have heard of immigrant detention centers. So we've got several of those in the community and just outside the community that can house between two and 3,000 people on any given night, and they do. Um, most of these people, um, the grand majority of them, are from Central America. 
So the countries that, as they mentioned and Ramon mentioned, uh, Honduras, Guatemala, El Salvador. And Ramon gave you the stats about how dangerous these places are right now. I think the most dangerous city in the world right now is uh, the capital of Honduras. It used to be the capital of El Salvador. Um, outside of an active, zo active zone of, of conflict, active uh, war zone, those are the most dangerous places in the world. Uh, Guatemala, half the population lives in deep poverty. And a lot of that you can trace to US influences, direct or indirect. Um, whether it's the more remote causes, like uh, our involvement in the civil wars in those countries in the 80s and 90s, um, or more recent examples, like the intervention uh, in Honduras that Azadeh referred to. Um, so we're very much involved, and that's historically been the case um, in Latin American migration in places like Dominican Republic, or, or Haiti, in other countries, uh, whether it's economic or whether it's military intervention. Um, you can trace a lot of the migration to the United States um, to U.S. foreign policy, or as I said, the lack of foreign policy. Another issue besides the, the, the economic issues, like free trade that have affected Central America through CAFTA, or, the, or NAFTA in Mexico, um, or uh, the poverty there, or um, the, the violence there, a lot of it's also bound up uh, in, our in our drug consumption our thirst for drugs. And this is something it, that particularly affects our community in El Paso. Um, you look at the contrast, for example, between El Paso, Texas, and our sister city of Ciudad Juarez. Um, they come up, one, like, up against each other. They, literally, if you looked at them on Google Maps, for example, you wouldn't be able to sort of distinguish where one ends and the other begins. They sort of bleed into each other. They grew up together, the two cities, as most of the border cities did from Tijuana, San Diego, down to Brownsville, Matamoros. Most border communities grew up together. They were one before they were divided by a wall or foreign policy. Um, Ciudad Juarez has also been one of the most dangerous cities in the world at, in the last 10 years. It's gotten safer and it's sort of, we're not sure where it's gonna go right now. But you can tie that directly to our consumption of drugs. Um, so places like Mexico, places like um, the, the Northern Triangle countries of Honduras, El Salvador, and Guatemala, they really become staging grounds uh, for drugs coming north uh, from countries like South America. Um, and uh, that is causing the political instability in those countries, that is causing the violence in those countries, compounded by the fact that they, they went through civil wars and that there's the availability of guns and there's a, a culture of violence that still lingers uh, in those countries. So we're bound up in all of that. From our perspective, so when you talk about things like the wall, um, the wall for us is just an something that's very offensive. Um, there's a perverse logic to the wall, um, not just because of how much it costs, not just because it divides families in Ciudad Juarez and El Paso and divides border communities, literally, and, and separates families, but because the logic of the wall presupposes that we can just close our eyes to these problems. The logic of the wall presupposes that we don't have to look at the root causes. Um, and we're bound up. Ethically and morally, we're, we're bound up in, in the, the drivers of migration, the drivers of violence and political instability, um, and in the violence in our sister city of Juarez. Um, and and our, our futures are bound up with each other. We know as border communities that places like El Paso and Ciudad Juarez because we can see each other, because we eat the same food, because we speak the same language, because we celebrate the same fiestas, we eat the same champurrada at Christmas time. We know our future is bound up with each other because we can see each other. But what we have to do is expand that notion of sort of a common humanity to places like Central America and to the people who are continuing to come and are filling our detention centers, that they're also our brothers and sisters um, and realize that our futures are bound up together. So. All that stuff like foreign policy, which, is, which can be abstract, becomes very practical um, and very human and very compelling at the local level in border communities. Qué complicado, ¿verdad? Very complicated. <laughs> eh, la posición del gobierno de los Estados Unidos desde hace años, no ahora con la nueva administración, ha sido muy clara. The The position of the United States for many years. Not only with Trump, mm -hmm. no, new, no with this new administration. Mm -hmm. It has been happening for many years. Mm -hmm. 
Es una apuesta muy clara. It's something that's very clear. Detener los flujos migratorios de to, seres humanos en la región. To stop the immigration flow. Parar la migración al norte. To stop the immigration to come to the north. Desde hace años observamos un incremento de la eh, militarización y la seguridad en la frontera sur. We have noticed an increment of more security in the border in the south. Y un incremento del de intervencionismo de las fuerzas militares de los Estados Unidos. And also an intervention from the United States military. En toda la región transfronteriza México, Guatemala. In all the frontier of Mexico and Guatemala. Eh, esta estrategia de externalización de fronteras y de cierre de fronteras se concreta en México. This, this borders that are being closed, it concretes and externalizes yes. the borders. Exter externalizes the borders, yes, mm -hmm. exactly. Eh, and it's a strategy. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Es una it's a strategy. It's a strategy. Que en México and tiene un nombre. Mexico has got a name. Programa Frontera Sur. Program Frontier South. Eh, el 7 de julio del año 2014. July 7th of 2014. El presidente mexicano Peña Nieto. The president of Mexico, Peña Nieto. Presenta el programa Frontera Sur. Presented the program Frontier South. Un programa. It's a program. Para mejorar la seguridad. To secure, to have more security. Garantizar el respeto a los derechos humanos. Guarantee the rights for human rights. Y reorganizar los flujos migratorios. And reorganize all the luxuries of immigration. Desde nuestra experiencia, tres años después. From our experience three years later. Ha sido un programa violatorio sistemático a los derechos humanos. It has been a violated system. La política migratoria ha sido persecución, detención y deportación masiva. It has been detention and deportation. Escu Massive. Massive. Escuchen estos números. Listen to these numbers. Desde el 1 de enero del año 2015 Since hasta 30 de septiembre de este año. Since January 1st of 2015 to the January of this year. La September. To September. To September. September of this year. Yes. Las autoridades mexicanas The Mexican authorities detuvieron, they detained 390,000 personas de Honduras, Salvador, Guatemala. 390,000 people from Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador. Y deportaron 372,000. And they deported 372,000. El control migratorio y de seguridad. The immigration control. Eh, en la frontera continúa siendo una prioridad. In the frontier, it continues being a priority. Eh, documentos públicos del Departamento de Estado de Estados Unidos. Public records from the United States. Hablan de cómo se dieron 86 millones de dólares. They talk about how they given 86,000 dollars. Para entrenar a las fuerzas de seguridad. To train the security uh, people. De México. Of Mexico. Y para mo modernizar los equipos de inspección y comunicación en la frontera sur and to also do new inspection, um, new inspection. Kind of like the security. Right, the to, security. To check the security yes. border. Mm -hmm. eh, pero esto no es nuevo. But this is not new. Hace 10 años. 10 years ago. Se presenta el programa Iniciativa Mérida. But they initiated the program uh, Mérida. The Mérida Initiative. Mérida Initiative donde se dieron 2.500 millones de dólares. 2.500 dólares. 2.500 millones de dólares. Para lo que decía Dylan, no, para la lucha contra eh, las drogas. For what Dylan said, you know, the fight against drugs. Sí, pero no sabemos cuánto de este dinero se usó para parar el flujo migratorio. But we don't know how much of this money was used to stop the flow, you know, the immigration flow. Eh, hablamos mucho del muro. We talk about the wall. Desde el año 2014, ya México es un muro en sí. From, that, from 2014, Mexico is already a wall. Y esto no es exclusivo de México. Esto está pasando también en los países de origen. 
And this is not just exclusively in Mexico. This is also happening in other borders and in other countries. Donde se está intentando detener y desincentivar el flujo migratorio. Where they're trying to stop the immigration flow. Donde se obstaculiza el flujo migratorio. Where it's... Uh, it, uh, Sí, obstaculiza. obstaculiza. Where obstacles of the immigration. Yes. Estas son algunas de las acciones directas de la política exterior de Estados Unidos en la región en tema migratorio. These are some of the facts that are going on in the immigration facts for the United States. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you all. So uh, we're actually doing quite a good job of staying on time. Uh, we're going to move on to our next question, uh, how do we drive politically viable, alterna viable alternatives to public policy frameworks of securitization and militarization? So this is kind of the flip question of that is, what are the alternatives that we're looking at and how are they viable? Um, I, that's important. I, I think. <clears throat> the way that we respond as a country um, to immigration, it sort of goes in cycles. What we're seeing now under the Trump administration, unfortunately, I don't want to give him too much credit because these things, are never, these things aren't new. Um, they've intensified, they've deepened our security policies, the militarization of the border, um, anti-immigrant policies, anti-immigrant rhetoric, anti-border rhetoric, anti-Mexican rhetoric. Um, you know, there's an expression in Latin, nihil nove sub soli. There's nothing new under the sun here. Um, unfortunately, it's been radicalized under the Trump administration. Um, but these things go in cycles. Our treatment of, of migrants goes in cycles. And we know that on the border, the militarization of the border um, has been largely a, a bipartisan, uh, the product of bipartisan politics that's taken place under Democratic and Republican administrations. Um, so sort of the response to immigration and the response to, and the creation of a border politics which favors policies of securitization and militarization um, has very, very long, very, very deep roots in our history. And we have to, we have to challenge that with alternative narratives. Um, I think that from, a, from our perspective on the border, there, there are some possibilities there. So uh, let me give you a few historical examples. So most of you, if you're not from the border, or even if you are from the border, if you went to elementary school, uh, in your textbooks, when you learned about Thanksgiving, you probably learned that the first Thanksgiving was in New England, right? I think it was 1621. Uh, 1621 in New England, sort of northern Europeans coming to this country, celebrating with or without natives. It's really not clear, right? There's all these mythologies around it. But sort of the origin story of our country is that. It's sort of northern. It's uh, northern European uh, and... Um, no offense to Protestants, but Protestant. Um, the, but in reality, if you come to our border community in El Paso, um, we celebrate sort of the alternative, or we don't say it's alternative, we say we celebrate the Thanksgiving. In 1598, Don Juan de Oñate, who was the son of a Mexican conquistador, came up from Zacatecas, Mexico, and crossed the Rio Grande. Um, and he came up with several hundred people, including Mexican frailes, you know, brothers, religious brothers, and, families and women and livestock and cattle and horses and, and all that. Um, and uh, across the Rio Grande in what's now uh, El Paso. And when he did that, he claimed the entire region north of the Rio Grande uh, for the Spanish crown. Um, the, um, they celebrated also with some indigenous communities there. It was on Ascension Thursday in 1598. So that was decades before the sort of conventional Thanksgiving that folks ordinarily learn about in their, in their textbooks. Um, for us, that's important because um, the, I think that we, what we have to, in order to create those compelling alternative frameworks or compelling alternative narratives in order to push back against those dominant paradigm, paradigms of militarization and security, securitization, they have to have some, there's got to be ideological substance there. There's got to be culture. There's got to be faith. There's got to be uh, parables, there's got to be, there's got to be something that drives it, something that's deeper, something historical and cultural. Um, and I think that you see that on the border, that there are all these alternative ways of looking at how we might structure society. So the very fact, for example, that that, that first Thanksgiving in San Elisario, just outside El Paso, Texas, is subordinated in our political, American political imagination, 
it reflects, I think, the subordination of certain axes in our, in our culture and history as Americans. There's sort of the subordination of the Latino, the Catholic, the indigenous, the African American, these different axes of our history to one that's Protestant, again, no offense, I'm ecumenical, that's Northern, that's New England, that's white, right? And, and those stories that we tell ourselves, those narratives, those paradigms, um, they enable certain policies, right? They're enablers of certain policies. So there's a certain subordination that's going on, even though that first Thanksgiving took place decades before the one in, in New England. So I think the, the work, of, the work of, of coming up with alternative frameworks has to be very deep. It has to be cultural. Um, it, has to, it has to be historical. It, has to, it depends on political invention. It depends on challenging some of the, the, the political narratives and political origin stories that we tell ourselves. And you've seen this in our politics, right? How it sort of goes back between making America great again. We, we sort of come up with these different monikers and stuff, which again are enablers of certain policies. Um, on the border, we know well that these policies of militarization, of securitization are simply enablers and that, that it's, it's, it's so much politics. Um, if you look at the wall, for example, um, the first sort of steel reinforced wall that went up in El Paso went up uh, in the 90s. That was the first time uh, we ever had that big sort of ugly uh, steel rusty wall that you, you might see on TV when they show stories about the border. Uh, right? They always show the wall as if there's nothing there. We're not people, we're not having parties, we're not marrying each other, we're not celebrating. We just have wall, that's it. Our life is dominated by the wall. Right? Again, the stories that we tell ourselves. Um, but that wall went up at, at the same time that, uh, that NAFTA was happening. Right? And again, NAFTA was eminently bipartisan. It was started by a Republican and ushered uh, to completion by a Democratic president. Um, and so for us, we, we sort of see the, the, the false narrative behind these myths of securitization and, 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 and militarization. It, it was fundamentally economic. It had to do with economic policy. Uh, when NAFTA created that common market between Mexico, the United States, and Canada, um, it, it predicated higher profits on the lack of mobility of labor. And that's why the wall went up. So we know that these discussions about walls, these discussions of militarization and securitization, they often enable other policies which have nothing to do, and, and they're just so much politics. Um, so we need to be critical. We need to create a critical consciousness. And in border communities, we think because of our history, because of our identity, uh, our historical identity, our social identity, even our religious identity, that we have the tools, we can draw upon the resources and the wisdom of our historical traditions and our culture in order to sort of diagnose these false narratives, push back on these false narratives, and begin to create a different culture and, and, and different alternative narratives. I think being in a Catholic university, I'll mention uh, Pope Francis. Pope Francis visited our border uh, just, I guess, a year and a half ago. Um, he came to the border and he celebrated a mass at the border during his trip to Mexico. It was the last thing he did before he went back to the Vatican uh, after his trip to Mexico. Um, and for us, that was, that was very special. It was in Ciudad Juarez and he came right to the river um, and prayed for migrants in silence. Um, and for us, that, that, that was so special because they dignified, in a sense, our border identity. Um, and Pope Francis, puts it so well, he, he, he's sort of recovering um, this, this deeper gospel, gospel tradition of the dignity of the peripheries, the dignity of those lost axes, the dignity of those lost narratives. And what he's really saying is that those who live a border existence, whether it's geographical or social um, or racial uh, or economic, those who live a border existence, um, that they can actually be protagonists of a new future. And so I think we have to dig deep. We have to look to the margins. We have to look to those who are suffering. We have to look to those who are suffering policies um, that are exogenous, that come from faraway places like Wall Street or, or Washington, D.C. Or, um, and, and the people who are actually suffering, we have to involve them and get their perspective in being able to come up with solutions to pu push back on, on some of those false narratives. And as Catholics, I think that you know, Pope Francis is reminding us that we have this deep within our tradition to recover some of those subordinated histories. So 
um, I think we need to draw connections between our different movements. Um, so, um, you know, for example, we're talking about, you know, protection of immigrants' rights and forced migration. That conversation cannot be divorced from uh, basically, you know, what we were just talking about. Um, what sort of created the conditions that forced people to flee? You know, tendency that um, you see on the part of many immigrants' rights organizations working in the U.S. is to focus on the rights of people once they get here. It's a very sort of closed framework. Um, and, you know, it's appreciated to acknowledge that all immigrants have constitutional rights and, you know, there's sort of a lot of, you know, misconceptions about that as well. But we need to move beyond that. Um, and we need to um, form alliances with organizations that are um, actively fighting to change U.S. foreign policy and holding the U.S. government accountable. Um, and, you know, bringing those conversations to the fore. So, you know, when we have forums on immigrants' rights, we need to also be talking about, you know, forced migration and the U.S. role in creating forced migration and, you know, giving um, the platform to people, you know, fleeing repression in Honduras and El Salvador and Guatemala, but also, you know, the Middle East, um, who have been victimized by the policies of the U.S. government to talk about their experiences. Um, and then, you know, what we have done, for example, in Georgia, as I mentioned, you know, we're fighting against um, um, the abuse of immigrants in um, Georgia immigration detention centers. And by the way, I would like to encourage you all to read um, our report we released in May called Imprison Justice, a Look Inside Two Immigrant Detention Centers in Georgia, both of them operated by corporations. And so, you know, we've had this movement going on for the past 10 years. Um, and, you know, the past few years, we have actually partnered with the School of America's Watch. I'm sure many of y'all are very familiar um, with them um, trying to shut down the School of America's um, that has basically trained military officers from Latin America in tactics of repression. Um, and, um, you know, they basically, um, uh, you know, they were trying to hide what they were doing until um, a torture manual was basically um, discovered. Uh, and so that led them to change their name. Um, but, you know, it hasn't sort of hidden the fact that, you know, they still are, are engaging in this, in this work of, um, teaching tactics of um, repression to, to these people from Latin America. Um, and so we basically decided, you know, the movement in Georgia, um, Georgia Detention Watch and, you know, other folks um, working around that, uh, partnering with the School of America's Watch um, so that we talk about this issue in a holistic manner, um, realizing that for, um, you know, for, for things to change, we need to start at the roots uh, in terms of changing U.S. foreign policy. And um, I can say that in 2015, we probably had the largest rally ever at an immigration detention center in the country um, because all of those folks who had come down to Georgia um, at the time for a School of America's Watch activities um, came to the rally at the Stewart Detention Center to shut it down. So we had about 1,000 people from all across the country. And, you know, hopefully that can happen everywhere, everywhere in the U.S. when these, um, you know, these types of um, abuses are happening. And then we also need to connect our movement in the U.S. with movements elsewhere. You know, people all over the world are fighting against borders, which, you know, I very much actually think that borders need to be abolished. Um, I know it sounds radical in the U.S., but this is very much a conversation that is happening in many other parts of the world, you know, including Europe and Latin America. Um, you know, we need to be moving towards having those conversations about a borderless world. And, you know, let's, let's think about how borders came to being in the first place. Um, you know, obviously they are artificial creations um, created by oftentimes imperialist states. And the purpose is and was um, to keep communities of color in check, to create borders around, you know, uh, wealthy areas, to keep other, other people out. Uh, and then to create and use, you know, military forces to be able to enforce that. And that is happening very much in the U.S. and elsewhere. So in terms of drawing connections between our movement, movements here um, and, you know, um, internationally, um, you know, let's look at Palestine and, um, you know, the experience of Palestinians and how they're fighting against oppression, um, you know, of the Israeli occupation, um, of their lands. 
And so, um, you know, you see the same types of corporations that are um, sort of um, trying to um, support the Israeli government, um, you know, apparatus of repression, G4S, for example, those same companies are being utilized by the U.S. government for purposes of border surveillance. So, you know, these connections um, need to be made. You know, you have the U.S. government and the Israeli government um, basically uh, engaging in um, exchanging tactics of uh, repression. So uh, in Georgia, we actually have a program um, called Gili um, that um, originates at Georgia State. And what happens is that law enforcement from across Georgia, including where I live in Atlanta, the Atlanta police, every year are, are sent to Israel to receive training. Training in what? <laughs> training in how you know, Israeli uh, occupation forces are repressing Palestinians. So learn those tactics, come back to the city of Atlanta, where we have a lot of you know, various communities of color, to then you know, uh, basically utilize th those same tactics against our people. And so I think you know, the same way that you have um, imperialist governments sort of exchanging tactics, we, as the people of the world, need to be you know, actively building alliances um, with folks elsewhere and to learn from their example um, of you know, how they're fighting back. Um, we actually saw that in another context, a movement for black lives, Black Lives Matter. So a delegation um, of the folks from Movement for Black Lives went to Palestine and saw with their own eyes in terms of what's happening. Um, and then they came back to the U.S. and as they drew up their, um, basically their agenda for um, black liberation, they very much included in their uh, solidarity with Palestinians and support for the tactics of boycott, divestment, and sanctions. And they came under attack massively, massively by many organizations that prior to this had claimed that they were in support of you know, black liberation and movement for black lives when they saw the mention of Palestine in there. They started attacking the movement for black lives viciously. But much to their credit, the movement for black lives and Black Lives Matter did not backtrack. They said that, look, we went there, we saw what was happening, we saw tactics of repression. It's actually very similar you know, in some ways to what the police are doing to black communities here. And so why should we backtrack? You know, why should we not be engaging in telling the truth? And why shouldn't be engaging in basically exchanging tactics of resistance? Um, and, and you saw that also happening you know, in Ferguson when the police was attacking communities of color. You saw Palestinians tweeting um, you know, suggestions for you know, what to do uh, when the police are attacking you. This is how to survive basically under governmental repression. Thank you, Azadeh. And so, so, yeah, I hope that we can all um, engage in uh, more sort of conversations with people around the world. Ramon. Eh, bueno, yo creo que todos queremos seguridad y prosperidad. I think we all want security and prosperity. Pero no a costa de represión y militarización. But not to the cost of repression or militation. Eh, nada va a parar la movilidad humana en la región. Nothing is going to stop the mobility of human of humans in the world. Human, mobi mo hu hu human mo mobility, I'm sorry. Si no trabajamos con las causas estructurales en los países de origen. If we don't work with the causes, structural causes in those countries. Eh, hablaban mis compañeros de redes. My partners were all talking about Networks. 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 Thank you. Eh, el año pasado y este, bueno, este año, mejor dicho, hubo un gran movimiento social y activismo aquí en los Estados Unidos. Last year and this year there was a huge movement here in the United States. Pero hay que dar continuidad a esto. But we have to continue that. Y ustedes, todos and, y todas, and you all, eh, tienen que activar ese defensor que llevan dentro. You need to activate that defense. Eh, desde mi perspectiva. From my perspective, eh, tienen que aumentar la presión en su gobierno. You need to raise up the pressure on your government. Eh, el gobierno de los Estados Unidos destina mucho dinero 
para programas de desarrollo en Latinoamérica. The government does give a lot of money to projects in Latin America, development projects. Uh -huh. Pero se está usando este dinero correctamente. But is this money being used correctly? Esa es una pregunta que ustedes tienen que hacer a su gobierno. That is a question that you have to ask your government. El año 2014, eh, Estados Unidos lanza en noviembre un programa para el desarrollo de América Central. In 2014, the United States developed a program for Central America. El plan Alianza para la Prosperidad. The program is called Alliance for Prosperity. Eh, hay que preguntar qué pasa con este plan. Está activo, está llegando el dinero. We need to ask what is going on with this plan. Is it active and is the money really getting there? Eh, hay que poner presión en que haya un desarrollo económico sostenible y local. We need to um, make sure that we put pressure on the development of that local program. Si una persona no tiene sus necesidades más básicas, se va a ver forzada a migrar. If a person doesn't have its basic needs, they're going to be forced to migrate. Eh, Estados Unidos debe impulsar la lucha contra la corrupción. The United States needs to enforce the fight against corruption. En Guatemala, en los últimos años, ha habido una lucha fuerte y ha habido avances importantes. In Guatemala, there has been a very large fight and there has been advances. Esto tiene que pasar en México y en el resto de países de Centroamérica. This has to happen in Mexico and in the rest of the countries of Latin America. El acceso a la justicia. The access to justice. Eh, es otro punto vital eh, que debemos de impulsar. It's another vital point that we need to uh, put pressure on. En México no hay acceso a la justicia. Hay una impunidad total. In Mexico, there is no access to the justice. No solo, no solo afecta a su población local. It affects the um, local um, community, mm -hmm. the Mexicans. Sino también a las personas en movilidad. But also the people that are in mobility. Y tenemos que dar oportunidades para los jóvenes. We need to give opportunities to the young. Que no se vean obligados. That they do not feel obligated. A migrar. To migrate. Eh, hay que buscar soluciones integrales. We need to find solutions. Eh, si no, nada ni nadie va a parar los movimientos migratorios en la región. If not, no one or nothing will stop these migrations in the regions. Gracias, thank you. So we're going to open up the floor for about 15 minutes for questions, answers, comments. I ask that you limit your question comments to two minutes at the most so we get as many people as possible in on the conversation. So who would like to begin? Oh, and Yusuf has the microphone, so please raise your hand so we can walk a microphone over to you. <coughs> Hi, I was wondering if uh, all of you could comment uh, very briefly on whether you feel that the UN agenda on forced migration refugees has been effective at all or whether there's been any changes as a result of their agenda that you see locally uh, on the ground. Um, I guess a few words on that. I, I think that the, the movement that you're seeing right now towards the, the development of the Global Compact it's been very positive. Um, um, there can be disagreements, um, but overall, I think that there's been a, um, you know, the heightened awareness, heightened attention given to this by the member states, and we're seeing some forward momentum on that. Pope Francis has really um, supported this this uh, movement. I think that um, you know, sort of the the elephant in the room is the United States, right? Um, because the United States, we sort of, we're, we're not really, we're, we're not part of the process. <laughs> we don't want to be part of the process. And, and at the end of the day, it's all flatus votus. It's just words on paper. Um, I think that, uh, you know, when you look at the way that the, way that the United Nations is, is looking at this problem of forced migration, 
um, the, the, defini the definition that they have of refugees and so forth, it, it, it just conflicts with the way that we look at it. You know, we have these false distinctions between refugees and asylum seekers, and we put up all these barriers um, to human mobility. Uh, so we're looking at it from just a very different perspective. Um, uh, so I think it's good overall um, in, in the long term. It's great that we see the consolidation of these processes towards the recognition of the rights of the migrant and the, the process of the global compact I think is, is good and, and, and is in the, in the right direction. And just the question of where is the United States in this? And, and again, this is for us as a border community, this is a very, um, uh, just a very down, it hits home for us because um, we you know, even though things like Mexican migration, migration from Mexico is at a historic low right now. Um, and, um, you know, the border is historically at a point where it's very hard to pass. The border has been hardened um, to the point where, um, you know, the um, folks who are being interdicted across the border, those numbers um, show that migration is really dropping across the U.S.-Mexico border. People continue to come, and those are the people from Central America, the Northern Triangle countries from Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador. And again, you know, the reason that I mentioned that these countries are just so politically unstable, that there's such um, rampant poverty, um, that there's violence and insecurity, these are refugees, um, mothers and children who are coming to our southern border, um, to South Texas, to El Paso, um, who are coming up to Arizona. Um, these really are, these people fit you know, mothers and children and unaccompanied minors, these are people who fall into the category of refugees. Um, but what we're seeing, um, you know, my experience at the southern border is that we're turning these people away systematically. Whether we're actually turning them away, we're saying, no, the border's closed, you need to turn back. Or um, we're detaining them for longer periods of time, we're detaining more people, or uh, we're separating families at the U.S.-Mexico border. Um, or, you know, we're treating refugees as criminals, you know, uh, credible fear interviews that are offered to, to people to see if they qualify for asylum status or really interrogations. I mean, there's just a whole host of different elements that you can really say we're systematically turning these people away. So this category of people that the, the process of the United Nations is meant to recognize their rights, the United States um, were systematically under the Trump administration, but really is the consolidation of a long process that goes back many years, we're criminalizing these people um, and we're not recognizing them as bearers of rights, the right to migration. So again, the U.S. is, we're just the wrench, the monkey, in this, the wrench in this, in this process, unfortunately. Eh, desde nuestra perspectiva, From our perspective, la, el sistema de Naciones Unidas, the system of the U.N. tiene una posición muy débil y muy poco crítica. Does have a position that's very very um, weak. Weak. weak weak right now mm -hmm. yes ellos están en su mundo they're in their own world y nosotros estamos haciendo la batalla abajo and we're doing we're continuing the fight on the bottom eh, a mí me cuestiona mucho la posición del UNHCR it questions me a lot the U UNTI en la región in the region están de desincentivando la migración hacia el norte. They are disintifying the immigration in the north. Están intentando que la gente vaya a Costa Rica, a Belice, a Panamá. They're trying to get people to go to Costa Rica, Belice, and Panama. ¿Por qué no quieren que vayan hacia el norte? ¿Qué interesa ahí detrás? Because they don't want anybody to come to the north. Eh, están incluso incentivando Guatemala como país de destino cuando Guatemala es un país con un nivel de inseguridad muy alta. They are incentive, they're doing an incentive for people to go to Guatemala saying that that is the place to be when Guatemala is at the worst. Eh, desde el año pasado tenemos una agencia de Naciones Unidas para la migración. Since last year we do have an agency of United Nations for Immigration. ¿Qué está haciendo la Organización Internacional de las Migraciones? What, it's, what is the uh, immigration United, the United Immigration um, Agency doing? Para defender y frenar las violaciones sistemáticas a derechos humanos en la región. To defend and to stop all the violations of the migration, mm -hmm. of the immigrants to the nation. Y cuidado, aquí hay que incluir la Comisión Interamericana de Derechos Humanos. And here we also have to include also the Inter-American Inter Commission. Commissioner, yeah. Sí. Recientemente la Comisión Interamericana publicó 
un comunicado de prensa. There is there was a press conference. Press release. A press release. In June this year. In June of this year. Donde felicitan al gobierno mexicano por su sistema de protección. Where they congratulate the Mexican government for their protection. Ahora vamos a hablar de ello. Now we're going to talk about that. Yeah, we have a. Uh, hello, I have a question about the role of the media. I'd like to get your opinion about the role of the media, not only uh, North American media, but uh, media in the countries in South America, uh, not only uh, the, the dailies, the, the, the traditional press, but also social media. Uh, con permiso, quisiera mm -hmm. uh, saber lo que ustedes piensan sobre uh, el papel de que desempeñan los diarios, uh, el periodismo, uh, ni solo aquí en los Estados Unidos, sino también en América Central, mm -hmm. y ni solo los diarios tradicionales, el periodismo tradicional, sino también uh, los medios sociales como Facebook, Twitter. Gracias. Thank you for your presentations. Um, and my question uh, may be one that uh, all of us could think about over the conference, and, and I'd love to hear the panelists reflect. <coughs> um, it picks up on the themes we're talking about here, and I'm wondering how we all as human rights advocates, educators, as media journalists, um, how can we work to change the broader public discourse in this country so that immigration isn't discussed as a domestic policy, but as an international, you know, real critique of U.S. foreign policy, um, given the context of the U.S., where um, there's a lot of indifference to what's happening outside the borders here, um, and also a lot of ignorance and misinformation and really uh, kind of silencing, silencing of what's happening in the U.N. process. And so are there ways that we might work more systematically as a human rights movement to lift up the UN processes that can be helpful to human rights defenders in cities and in communities um, and really help, help us work more systematically as a national movement to shape and challenge the discourse that's coming out of Washington, um, which is really um, very difficult for us to fight individually in isolated places given the nature of how people just think about the, the issues. So thank you. Yeah. All right. So we have a question on the media and then one on how, how do we help lift up UN processes? So I think the media definitely has a um, very important role to play. Unfortunately, um, in a lot of, just as an example, in a lot of main, mainstream media outlets, um, the, the phrase illegal immigrant is it still being used or illegal alien. Um, and so you know, there is a push to, to try to get these outlets to abolish that word. Um, obviously, the way we talk about immigrants, um, you know, our fellow human beings is very important. And just by the usage of that phrase, you already are dehumanizing people. Um, I remember an example, too, actually, right after, um, you know, we saw the humanitarian crisis at the border where, you know, mothers and children were fleeing back in 2014, 2015, and the U.S. government, instead of providing them refuge, was basically uh, putting people, mothers and children, in detention centers as an attempt to um, try to keep others who needed protection from fleeing and coming to the U.S. A mainstream media outlet referred to a six-month-old infant as a detainee. Um, I know in my work, and as I you know, mentioned, um, you know, we do a lot of work on detention, and we are very um, intentional about referring to people in detention as detained people, detained immigrants, incarcerated people, incarcerated immigrants, rather than talking about people as detainees, as prisoners, as inmates. Um, so I think we can all sort of be more intentional on that front, and hopefully the relationships that we build with media outlets will um, help us persuade um, for them to also move in that direction. Social media has Big role to play. I myself joined Facebook actually um, because of an immigrant rights campaign um, to try to, um, you know, 
make people aware of what's happening. I think especially with um, younger folks, they pay a lot more attention to Facebook um, than to you know, what's covered sort of in, um, in the outlets. Um, I do want to sort of um, highlight one area of concern, though, about social media and our engagement on social media. So um, on October 18th, um, the same day that the third iteration of the Muslim ban was going to go into effect, had it not been stopped by federal courts, um, who saw exactly what the Trump administration was trying to do in terms of dressing up the Muslim ban uh, in an attempt to evade judicial review. So on that same day, October 18th, the federal government also implemented policies to formally spy on the social media accounts of immigrants. And I say formally because you know it's a well-known fact among many of us who are activists that the government is probably watching us closely and has been doing so for many years. Um, but basically, this sort of surveillance is not going to only be targeted at people who are applying for visas or even just to visa holders who live here or even just to permanent residents. It's going to apply to naturalized citizens as well. And the information is presumably going to go in our files. So I guess the question I have as a naturalized citizen myself is what, what is the business of the government, of the US government, to try to see what I post to social media? You know, other than trying to repress my freedom of a speech? So does that mean that every time now that I post, um, you know, and, and I'm you know, very vocal on social media about you know, various policies of federal government and state governments, so does that mean that every time before posting something as a US citizen, I now have to think twice about whether this will somehow sort of endanger my, myself in some way or another? Which is, you know, as Americans, people you know, who live in this country where presumably free speech is one of our fundamental rights, that is not something that any of us should be worried about. So, um, so just something to keep in mind and think about some more. I think um, the media, you know, sort of there's this uh, there's this uh, since the election, you know, a lot of the media has been under attack, right, in different ways. And I think that actually, I mean, there's, that's certainly the case, right? um, by, by at least by certain actors, right? But um, I think that we're actually perhaps we're on the cusp of a a, a, goal, a, re, a new golden age in journalism because of that, in this sense, you know. Media has been going through sort of, uh, you know, some pressures, redimensioning because of looking for new financial models and so forth, and, and now we've gone through a particularly uh, bitter political process. But on this side of all that, um, I think that the, the role of the media as sort of the guardians of truth has been reburnished, right? Has been, has been reaffirmed. And I think that um, when we're dealing with migrants, particularly in this country, um, we're working oftentimes, especially when we're talking about asylum seekers and refugees, uh, we're, we're talking about a population that's often invisibilized. Um, so we've got, you know, almost 33,000 folks in detention center beds every night um, whose stories are not told. Um, we've got, uh, you, you know, the facts, again, the border has been so politicized that the idea that the border is porous or dangerous or, you know, that, that we need a wall, those are all predicated on, on myths and lies. Um, you know, if you look at border security, for example, since 2004, we've doubled the number of border patrol agents now to 20,000. Um, we've doubled the number of ICE agents. We've doubled the number of CBP agents since 2004. Um, we now spend $20 billion on immigration enforcement in this country. $20 billion, which is larger than the, the amount of money that we spend on the FBI, the DEA, the ATF, um, the Marshals, the Secret Service combined. Um, so there are a lot of myths, I think, that, that this, you know, journalism, I think journalists find themselves in a new, there's a, there's a possibility of a new culture where journalists are really at the vanguard of truth um, and can really play a role in busting some of those myths and looking at populations that are invisibilized and giving them a voice. So I'm encouraged by that. Social media, I, I think that, you know, the same possibilities. There are dangers, obviously, of social media, but there are a lot of possibilities, too. If you look at, for example, the Dreamers and the Dreamer movement, um, that was sort of a, an autonomous, the development, you saw the development of an autonomous, call it a political subjectivity, uh, you know, a group of people, a, a new group with a new, a new, a new bearers of rights, right? And it was completely self-generated. And social media played a huge part in that. 
So I think on social media, you can have those conversations and dialogues and form the networks and the linkages between different movements um, to, to, to produce you know, those new political subjectivities that are going to bring us forward in politics so that we're not always fighting, but we're, we're, we're on the vanguard and we're advancing, um, we're advancing rights. So those possibilities are definitely there. Um, there's a lot of hope on the horizon. Eh, la segunda pregunta. The second question. Eh, los estados, los gobiernos se están organizando. The governments and the states are, are organizing. Para crear un marco de protección a personas migrantes y refugiadas. To create a protection for immigrants. Bajo el paraguas de las Naciones Unidas. Under the UN. Eh, nosotros pensamos que estos marcos de protección We think that these protection borders van a tener muy poco impacto real en el terreno. Will have very low impact in the territory. Ya tenemos que pensar. Now we have to think. Cómo, como sociedad, how as a, a society, vamos a contrarrestar eso. We are going to counter in a, under counter that. Eh, tenemos que mirar a ejemplos previos. We need to look at previous examples. Dylan hablaba el, el ejemplo de los dreamers acá. Dylan was talking about the example of the dreamers. Eh, América Latina vivió un movimiento muy interesante. Latin America lived a very inter interesting movement. Eh, relacionada con la teología de la liberación. Related to the theology of the liberation. Que es muy sencillo. It's very simple. Es la organización y la lucha social desde la base. It's the fight of the social organization from the base. La oposición tiene que venir desde lo local, desde lo comunitario. The opposition has to come from the local, from the bottom. Y es responsabilidad. And it's a responsibility. De universidades como esta. Of universities like this one. De defensores. Of defenders. De ciudadanos normales. Citizens, normal citizens. Que veamos cómo vamos a protegernos that we see how we're going to protect ourselves. Y cómo vamos a proteger a estas personas. And how we're going to protect it, also protect these people. Con necesidad de protección. With the need of protection. El resumen, el cambio tiene que venir desde el local, desde abajo. All the change has to come all the way from the local, from the bottom. Los cambios nunca van a venir desde arriba. The changes will never come from the top. Thank you very much. So we're going to move on to our final question, and then we'll have another short Q&A session. What is the role of the Mexican government to attend to forced displacement from Central America? I think Ramon has said it, has said it all. I, I mean, the Mexican government is not, um, is not a friendly actor in this arena. Um, and, and as Ramon pointed out, you know, um, as I did mention, the 2014 humanitarian crisis, when you had the spike in the numbers of, of mothers and children and unaccompanied children who were coming to the border, um, and our response to that, and remember, this was the Obama administration, our response to that phenomenon was um, to fund uh, the Mexican government, which, as Ramon mentioned, was uh, Plan Frontera Sur, the, the southern border plan. Um, and basically, we simply extended the logic of the border, the logic of the U.S.-Mexico border, south. The logic of militarization, the logic of securitization, the anti-immigrant logic, we extended that south. So we funded the program uh, that interdicted migrants in the south of Mexico and created sort of this holding pad holdings area where migrants really couldn't come up north. And what that did is it did the same thing that the U.S.-Mexico border wall did uh, when it came up in the 90s. It simply made the, the, the voyage, the, the trip for migrants, much more dangerous um, because they had to search for new routes, new more dangerous routes, and it created a market for migrant passage uh, where, with less than savory characters who are willing to offer their services for a lot of money. So um, Mexico has, is just a nightmare for migrants coming up through Central America, and that is related to our response and our support for the Mexican government. Um, and um, Mexico has just simply not demonstrated itself a friend of migrants uh, in any respect. But I, I defer to it more. Miren, el año pasado, last year, el presidente mexicano Peña Nieto, the president of Mexico Peña Nieto, en el contexto de la cumbre, 
in the context of the Cumber, de Nueva York, of New York eh, dijo que iba a fortalecer el sistema de protección de refugio. He said he was going to enforce to make it stronger the refugee program. Y que iban a desarrollar alternativas a la detención. And they were going to develop also programs for the detention. Especialmente para los menores de edad. Especially for the underaged. La realidad es que el sistema de protección mexicano este año está peor que el año pasado. The reality is that the protection program now it's worse this year than last year. Eh, la respuesta del gobierno mexicano the response of the Mexican government eh, no es congruente it's not conclusive con su discurso with its discussion oficial de respeto de derechos humanos. Officially of uh, the rights to humans. Eh, es un discurso de doble moral. It's a double moral discussion. A mí me sorprende mucho It surprises me very much. Cuando vas a espacios de Naciones Unidas, when you go when you go to spaces of UN, y ves que la diplomacia mexicana, and you see that the Mexican diplomacy, es la promotora de los derechos humanos, is the promoter of human rights. Cuando están violando sistemáticamente los derechos más fundamentales, when they're violating the most fundamental rights, es muy muy importante que ustedes sepan. It's very important for you all to know que México ahora tiene su peor crisis de derechos humanos en la historia reciente. Mexico has the worst crisis of human rights Ayotzin since other years. Ayotzinapa es un ejemplo. Ayotzinapa is an example. Pero hay muchos más. But there are many, many more. Entonces, las personas vienen de Centroamérica expulsadas por violencia. So people come from Central America, ex you know, ex kicked out oh. from, you know, America. Mm -hmm. By violence. Mm -hmm. The violence. They're displaced by, by, the, by, 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 the, by the, violence. the insecurity. And, y México las recibe con más violencia. And Mexico receives them with more violence. Eh, nuestros estadísticas, nuestros números. Our statistics and our numbers. El programa Frontera Sur. The program Frontier South. Dispara las violaciones a los derechos humanos. It completely violates all the rights, the human rights. Mexico recibe a los migrantes. Mexico receives all the migrants. Con robos y asaltos. With um, assaults and also robbery. Mm -hmm. eh, con secuestro. With kidnapping. Con violación. With um, rape. Con desaparición, dije. Desa no. 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 Desaparición. With, with also disappearing, making mm -hmm. people disappear. Y con muerte. And with death. Eh, y en esto, and no, in this, no solo son grupos criminales, they're not just criminal groups, sino el pro los propios funcionarios del gobierno, the same people from the government, están involucrados en los crímenes. They're involved in these crimes. En 2015, 2016, in 2015 and 2016, recibimos, we received, 2,250, 2,250, Personas víctimas de algún tipo de delito en territorio mexicano. We received people that were some kind of victim in violence of Mexico. Y estamos a 30 millas de la frontera con Guatemala. And we're only 30 miles from the border of Guatemala. Es el principio. And that's just the beginning. El año pasado la violencia sexual incrementó un 70%. Last year the sexual crime it incremented 70%. Eh, ¿Por qué decimos esto? Why do we say this? Nos preguntamos si esta violencia we ask ourselves if this violence en la recepción de seres humanos in the reception of human rights no es una estrategia is not a strategy para que no vengan for them to not come el que no haya acceso a la justicia y el que haya tanta impunidad the one that doesn't have any justice or there's a lot of impunity es un freno it's a break este año publicamos un informe this year we publicized an informative junto con Gola y otras organizaciones de México, With Gola and also other organizations in Mexico, donde habla datos oficiales, it talks about um, official data, un 99% de impunidad, 99% of impunity, son cifras oficiales del gobierno mexicano, they are official numbers of the government, 
Eh, México habla mucho de fortalecer el sistema de protección para los refugiados. México talks a lot about making the uh, program of refugees even better. ¿Cómo es posible con esa política que hablábamos antes de detención y deportación masiva? How is that possible with that we were talking about the politics and the detention and immigration? ¿Cómo es posible que hablen de proteger a los menores? How is it possible that they talk about protecting the minors? Cuando México detuvo 2015 y 2016 79 mil menores. When Mexico took 79,000 minors in the years of 2015 and 2016. Y deportó a 71 mil. And deported 71,000 minors. ¿Dónde está el acceso a la protección internacional? Where is the access to protection, international protection? De esta deportación, el 90% son de Centroamérica. The 90% of the deportation is from Central America. Es decir, están deportando el 95% de los menores. They are deporting 95% of the minors. Eh, uno de los grandes problemas One of the biggest problems del sistema de recepción mexicano of the reception of Mexican uh, protection es que reciben con detención. They receive with detention. Las personas refugiadas muchas veces están detenidas en centros de detención migratorios. A lot of the times, the people, the refugees, are in detention centers. Si yo llego a la frontera de México, if I come to the border of Mexico, y pido protección internacional, and I ask for international protection, me llevan a un centro de detención. They take me to a detention center. Les quiero compartir un caso muy doloroso. I want to share with you a case, very, very painful case. El año pasado, una familia de Honduras. Last year, a family from Honduras. Venían con un niño de tres años llamado Miguel. They were coming with a minor of three years old named Miguel. La familia escapaba de violencia. The family was escaping from violence in Honduras. Miguel recibió tres disparos en su tripa, en su abdomen, mm -hmm. en Honduras. Miguel received three bullets in his abdomen, in his stomach. La familia llega a México. The, the family got to Mexico. Eh, piden protección internacional. They ask for international protection. Los ponen en un centro de detención. They put them in a detention center. Miguel está en una situación crítica, muy mala, de salud. Miguel being in critical condition. Y finalmente conseguimos la custodia de la familia. Finally, we were able to get custody of the family. Cuando el médico de inmigración nos da a Miguel, when the doctor from immigration gave us Miguel, Dice, el niño venía así de Honduras. The child was coming like this from Honduras. Automáticamente. Automatically. Miguel tuvo que ir al hospital. Miguel had to go to the hospital. Ir a la capital de Tabasco, a, lo, a un hospital especializado. Go to a specialized hospital in Tabasco, in the capital of Tabasco. Eh, sufrió una operación de urgencia. He had an emergency surgery. Y tres días después murió. And three days later he died. Semanas después, la familia recibe protección internacional. Weeks later, the family did receive international protection. Este es el sistema de protección mexicano. This is the system of Mexican protection. Podríamos hablar mucho, pero ahí lo voy a dejar. We could talk a lot more, but that's where we're going to leave it at. Thank you, Ramon. I just wanted to add um, a couple of words. Uh, I was honored to be a part of uh, the People's Tribunal focused on the San Fernando massacre where um, 72 people coming from Central America but also other parts of the world were moving through Mexico to come to the U.S. Um, and as Ramon and Dylan have mentioned, obviously the Mexican government is failing in its duties to protect and defend migrants who are going through Mexico. Um, and so as a result, um, these 72 migrants were targeted by the gangs and murdered. Um, and so there was a people's tribunal that was organized in Mexico City to try to give a voice to the family members of the murdered uh, migrants. Um, and this was basically the first time that a lot of them had had an opportunity to tell their story. Um, basically, the judicial systems in Mexico and in their home countries, not only, not to mention the U.S., had completely failed them. 
So um, we got the chance to hear from a Guatemalan mother who's um, basically whose husband, son, daughter, and um, a couple of other relatives had all been murdered. And, um, you know, the Mexican government didn't, didn't even have enough courtesy to send the bodies of, of her children to her. And then finally, you know, when they um, did send something, it was empty coffins. So I think that just goes to, um, you know, show you the sort of small or non-existent level of respect that the Mexican government has is for, for duties to, um, to protect and um, defend migrant communities. Um, and, you know, I think the result of sort of the additional U.S. pressure on the Mexican government to try to stop central migrants from coming to the U.S. has been, as you've heard from Ramon and Dylan, has been to just make things a lot worse. Um, so a case that was covered by the media actually was of um, two indigenous Mexicans uh, about a year or so ago who were basically trying to find jobs um, in the north of Mexico. So they were you know, kind of like moving um, through Mexico themselves. And so because there's so much pressure to try to capture central migrants, um, they were arrested by Mexican authorities. And um, because they didn't speak, you know, they spoke their indigenous language much better than spoke, they spoke Spanish, the Mexican authorities uh, suspected them of being Guatemalans. Um, and they basically tortured this brother and sister to try to get a confession from them that they're from Guatemala, you know, indigenous Mexicans. So I think that's you know, also another case as sort of a, you know, an example of the massive human rights violations happening right now, um, not only against uh, migrants, but also against indigenous Mexicans as well. Uh, we're going to open up the floor again for a couple of questions. So there's one right here in the front. I'm not sure what happened to the microphones. Uh, so. Let's take a couple of questions. I see a couple, I see three hands. So let's take those three questions and then have the panelists respond to them. See if these turn on? Great. Hello, um, I am a research assistant um, interviewing immigrants and refugees in the Dayton area as well as someone from a mixed status family. Something that I noticed from both of these experiences is the increased use of fear um, as well as like nativist language and xenophobia. Unfortunately, from this thing, from both my personal experience as well as the research, we've discovered that those most susceptible and vulnerable to this level of fear and um, general feeling of less self-worth is school children, um, the younger generations. And something that I was wondering, how can institu school institutions from both like early childhood as well as to the graduate level help address um, this, in, this issue as well as just making sure that the, our school systems are um, free from xenophobia as well as just addressing these issues that are affecting um, children. Um, Mr. Corbett, you mentioned that uh, part of what uh, seems to be contributing to um, migration is our thirst for drugs. And, and I'm wondering, um, given that the current status of the problem with opiate addiction in this country has been deemed a crisis, um, I'm wondering to what extent uh, do any of you see U.S. drug policy uh, domestically potentially adversely affecting uh, migration and, and uh, people who are migrating uh, in uh, South and Central American countries? Uh, my name is Stephanie, and I had the opportunity to visit Las 62 with the National Lawyers Guild last November. And so, um, being there, it's very clear um, how immigrant, like the immigrants, are seen in a way as one of the few industries that Mexico has. And I also had the opportunity to. Um, visit with the 43 missing students' parents in Ayotinapa. And one of the things that I connected um, with both of these cases is the, the, um, the, the lack of there being any industry in Mexico and how 
all of this, like the United States and all these transnational companies are coming into Mexico and also displacing people within Mexico. And so they're creating less jobs for Mexicans and also forcing them to move um, with a connection between the government and the drug cartels. So I don't know if any of you can comment on that, how we can prevent um, all of these big companies from coming into Mexico and destroying the few um, economic opportunities that exist in Mexico. So I'm going to answer your question or try to address your question about the experience of the school children. Um, you know, I think the rhetoric coming from the top Trump is very much responsible for creating the conditions, you know, in our communities and, our, and, and in our schools. Um, you know, the bullying of immigrants and um, people of color and, you know, Muslims in the schools is just, it, it's just, um, you know, rising to a really um, horrible level. Um, you know, I myself actually, speaking from personal experience, you know, I came to the U.S. in um, December 1994, middle of my sophomore year. And so um, I was in, in a school where, you know, in Memphis, Tennessee, I was the only immigrant um, and basically the only person of color. It was a really isolating experience for me. But really what made it worse was that um, this map that our history teacher had in the classroom, um, and I remember identifying Iran as a country of terror, um, that, you know, me as an Iranian, <laughs> being in that classroom, you know, already feeling isolated, and then hearing this message not only from other kids, but as from the teacher, as a speaker of authority, was just really horrible. And I just remember that, you know, when the Oklahoma City bombings happened, I just remember praying for two days uh, intensively that the person who committed that act of terror would not be a Muslim because of you know, the impact it would have as, on me as you know, a Muslim child. So I can't imagine you know, the experience that children had, have had you know, after 9-11, um, now you know, in the current atmosphere. And I think we have to go to where the source of the problem is, um, you know, to the US government and the rhetoric that is you know, on an everyday basis um, sort of um, targeting uh, communities of color, Muslims, and immigrants, and then you know, at the school level, again, it has to go to the top. You know, the principal, the teachers, um, you know, the way that they talk about, um, you know, about, about people of color and immigrants um, it, it is very important because that can have, you know, very direct impact on how then, how then you know, kids um, uh, act towards each other. The, uh, there was a New York Times story just after the inauguration that uh, talked about the children in our Las Cruces public school system in New Mexico, which is right on the border, and how the attendance had dropped dramatically. Um, and, and it's stabilized again. But uh, you're right to point out that the, the psychosocial effects on children of our broken immigration system are huge. And uh, the statistics are, are, are um, just astonishing. The amount, if you just look at the Latino, population, the undocumented on the border. There's been another study that came out last week about the population on the border, the folks, uh, children, people under 18 uh, who have attempted suicide or who have thought about suicide. Um, those numbers are huge. So we know that those that children are suffering the psychosocial effects of a broken immigration system. Um, schools can, can, can do a lot. We worked with the schools locally um, to inform teachers about, you know, do, doing Know Your Rights sessions for teachers. They can also get involved politically. School boards can take you know, positive action to say that we're a safe community. Uh, we're accepting of immigrants. We celebrate immigrants. We celebrate this dimension of our American identity. They can go further and say we're not going to we're not going to permit enforcement actions on on school property without without a warrant signed by a, a, a judge, for example. There are, there are a whole range of things, but we we really do need to be attentive to those effects on children. Absolutely. The question of drugs, um, I mean, there, no doubt there's a huge opiate crisis in this country. I think it's instructive, though, the, the, um, the response that you've seen to the opiate crisis. Um, we, we're seeing it as a crisis. 
Right? Often the reflex in the United States, when it, whatever the social problem is, we've been talking about militarization, but the reflex to social problems in this country has been a militarized response. And you saw that, for example, with the cocaine, you know, the response to cocaine or coke in this country, dramatically different than the, than the response that we're seeing to, to uh, opiates, right? With, with coke, it was a militarized response. It was increased detention, right? Increased enforcement. With opiates, we're recognizing that perhaps we have to look at it a little bit differently. Now, is race a factor there? Absolutely, right? Look at the consumers of opiates versus the consumers of coke. Right, so you can see again how these different axes um, and, and who's subordinated and who's not subordinated and what is the public policy response, um, they're, they're all interrelated. Um, but the, 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 it, our consumption is definitely a driver in the crisis. In Mexico alone, I don't know what the numbers are because they seem to go up every day, but more than 70,000 people, I think since 2006, since the sixth annual of Felipe Calderon, have died in, uh, as a result of, of the drug war in Mexico. Um, 70,000 people. Now, to put that in perspective, I, I can't remember what the latest figure is, but in the, war, in the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, I think we're approaching maybe 5,000 troops who have died, which is terrible and a tragedy and, and awful. 70,000 people in Mexico have died as a, drug, as a result of the drug war. Now, if, if you think that throwing money at this, at this crisis if you think that continuing the militarized response, if you think that supporting programs like Operacion Merida, the Merida Initiative, uh, which were funding the Mexican government, the Mexican government's militarized response to the crisis of drug um, substance abuse and, tr and trafficking in Mexico, if you think that those things are okay, then what you have to say, what you have to admit is that 70,000 deaths are an acceptable overhead in the, drug on, in the war on drugs. Um, I don't know what the solution is to our consumption of drugs. I'm sure that there are cultural factors, enemy, I'm sure there are economic factors. Um, I don't know what the solution is, but a militarized response isn't working because I don't accept 70,000 deaths as acceptable overhead in the war on drugs. I think that's perverse. We can do better. Um, and it hasn't arrested the flow of drugs at all. Drugs are more accessible in this country, uh, more cheaper than they've ever been, um, nothing has, has arrested the flow of drugs from, the, from south to north. Actually, one thing has, and I'm not saying I agree with legalization or anything like that, but if you look at marijuana, which has been legalized now in a couple of states across the country, you can now find marijuana, you can buy marijuana on the streets of Mexico City. Um, that's the only thing, the legalization of drugs, that has reversed that flow. Um, of drugs. The flow now actually is starting to go north to south, which I find fascinating. So all these deaths and the billions and billions and billions and billions of dollars since we began the war on drugs, I think in the Nixon administration, never reversed the flow of marijuana. And now you're seeing with the, ch the change of a couple laws that we have, um, I think we just have to completely relook at how we, uh, we, how we look at the, our, our public policy approach to drugs. I think that we're on the right track, opiates, looking at, acknowledging that it's a crisis and that it's multifaceted, and that it's social, and that it's a public health crisis, and that we shouldn't be responding to it in a militarized way or with increased enforcement. It is a public health crisis, and we have to look at it that way. Um, I'm sad that it took us this long to get to the point because opiates are consumed by white people. Um, it's taken us to this point to recognize that, but I'm glad that finally we're doing that, and hope, hope, hopefully we can expand those intuitions across the board, and hopefully we can actually do it something. We're not seeing the administration actually take any real effective action on this, despite the language. We need to continue to press the administration to follow through on their promises to, to address this um, in a real way. Eh, bueno. Well. Eh, <laughs> Dylan hablaba de eh, la guerra contra las drogas. Dylan has been talking about the war against drugs. El tema del terrorismo. The theme about, of course, terrorism. Eh, en la frontera sur, eso ha traído más presencia militar, policial, más persecución. In the south borders, it has brought more police, more justice, more um, persecution. persecution. Pero qué interesante. But very interesting. Si tú pones un mapa de la presencia militar, if you put a map of the military presence, y un mapa 
donde están los principales recursos naturales en el sur de México. If there, if there's also a map of the ecosystem, natural ecosystem in Mexico. Co coinciden. They collide. Donde hay más recursos naturales, hay más presencia militar y policial. Where there is more natural, um, where there's more natural um, sources. Sources. Resources. Resources. There is more military presence. En los últimos años han descubierto que el sur de México es rico en recursos naturales. In the last years, they have realized that there are natural, more natural resources in the south of Mexico. Y hay muchos intereses de grandes corporaciones detrás. And there are a lot of interests of big corporations behind that. El agua. The water. La producción hidroeléctrica. The production of hydroelectric. Los monocultivos. The multi, I'm sorry, the... ¿Cómo se dice? Monocultivos. Uh, single cultivated um, yeah. crops, crops, thanks. Single yeah. crops, right. Sí. right. Crops. La palma africana, Crop. la palma de aceite, ¿no? Crops Mono that have not been genetically palm. modified. Yeah. We don't even have palm. a word for that anymore. Right. <laughs> la minería. <laughs> the miners. Sí. Mines. The mines. mines. Sí. Mm -hmm. Entonces, qué, qué interesante, ¿no? Que al final es un control del territorio por recursos naturales. But of course, at the end, there is definitely control of natural resources. Y eso está provocando mucho desplazamiento. And that is, um, that is causing, a lot of, causing a lot of displacement. Uh -huh. De comunidades indígenas en el sur de México. Of a lot of communities, a lot of indigenous communities in Mexico. Comunidades guatemaltecas, ahora hay cinco o seis desplazamientos. In Guatemala, in indigenous, um, there are like five or six um, displacements. Uh -huh. Entonces, esto obviamente causa más movimiento de personas, ¿no? So, obviously, this will cause more movement of people. Eh, muy rápidamente, los menores. The minors. Eh, estamos perdiendo una generación en Centroamérica. We are losing a whole generation in Central America. Como consecuencia de la falta de acceso a derechos. From the, from the lack of human rights, access to the human rights, access to the human rights, y de la violencia. and of, the, of course, the violence. Um, ¿qué podemos decir a un adolescente hondureño? What can we say to a young Honduran que child uh -huh. que, que quiere ser reclutado por las maras o por las pandillas? That wants to be recruited by the gangsters, you know, the maras. En 2014 fue la crisis de la niñez migrante acá. 2014, it was the crisis of migrants, migrants here. Nuestros números. Our numbers. De 2014 a 2016. From 2014 to 2016. La llegada de adolescentes no acompañados. The coming of youngsters not with anybody, with any adult supervision. Uh -huh. eh, incrementó un 300%. Has incremented to 300%. Pero no se habla de esto. But we don't talk about that. No interesa. It just, it's not interesting. Eh, para finalizar, eh, se habla de México como tercer país seguro. To finalize this, we talk about uh, Mexico being the third one to be safe. A third safe country. So mm -hmm. third safe country, mm -hmm. yes. Eh, ¿Está México preparado? Is Mexico prepared? El gobierno mexicano, no. The government of Mexico, it's not. La sociedad mexicana podría. The, the society in Mexico, they could. Uh -huh. Porque México antes, en los 80, los 90, recibió a la población desplazada por, por guerras. Because in years prior, like 80s and 90s, Mexico did receive displacement people from, you know, other countries. Eh, México tiene que pensar en un sistema de acogida con integración. Mexico has to think about opening, you know, for people that come in. No un doc, solo un documento migratorio. Not just a document that's from immigration. Si no hay acceso. If there's no access. A educación. To education. A salud. To health. A un trabajo con un salario digno. To work with a good salary. Los refugiados van a cruzar los Estados Unidos. The refugees are going to cross the United States. Muchas gracias. Uh, many thank yous. We started a couple minutes late, so I'm actually going to ask the panelists if they just have one final thought, one minute each, uh, to leave us with. It can be a question or just a final thought. 
that would be great. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Sorry, apologies. I'm coming from Ireland. Um, I'm, um, I was a practitioner in refugee rights. Um, I'm now a doctoral researcher. Um, but um, strangely enough, when I was a practitioner, I worked with two organizations. I worked with the Latin American Solidarity Center and I worked with the Irish Refugee Council. So um, part of my time I spent raising awareness of human rights issues, which we've heard a lot about tonight or today, um, and the other part dissuading asylum seekers from <laughs> Latin America from applying for asylum in Ireland, because in Europe we do have a threshold of refugee, potential refugee, um, or people who would get refugee status. Um, obviously you have Syria, Afghanistan, etc. And we would tell people from Latin America, just don't do it because the threshold is not high enough, you're not going to get status. So my question, and I, I mean, obviously anybody can apply when they want to, but we were, would always tell people, try and find other ways of staying in Ireland that are through the Migrant Rights Centre, etc. Um, so my question is, is the big barrier the, the Refugee Convention? The fact that it favours individual rights over group rights? Um, in the sense that we're constantly trying to fit people into boxes instead of looking at things such as structural violence um, as a potential for, for getting uh, people's status within um, a country that they've uh, been displaced to. Um, the second question within the same concept is uh, in this structural violence, if we are trying to as, as, um, address this with aid, um, uh, we, well, research has found that people who are from uh, middle-income countries are more likely to, to migrate, obviously, because they have the means. So is really the solution open borders? And if so, how, how would that look like? Yo soy español. I'm from Spain. Y viví tres años en Irlanda. And I lived three years in Ireland. La política europea es igual que lo que estamos sufriendo aquí. The politics in, the, in Europe is the same as we're living here. Es externalizar mi frontera. It's just external of our frontier. Hay cuotas. There are quotes. Que mi gobierno, el gobierno español, no está respetando. That my um, government in Spain is not respecting at all. Eh, el gran problema con eh, refugiados centroamericanos The big problem with refugees from Central America es que eh, no se reconoce la violencia por pandillas. They don't recognize the violence from gangs. Si un joven centroamericano va a Irlanda o va a España, tiene serios problemas para ser reconocido. If there is a young Hispanic child that goes to Ireland or anywhere else, it is very difficult for him to be recognized. La gran ventaja en México The advantage of Mexico es que hay, un, hay un, una declaración que se llama Declaración de Cartagena There is a declaration called the Declaration of Cartagena que amplía la protección that opens up the protection. Y es una herramienta útil para ofrecer protección por violencia de pandillas de maras. And it's a very useful tool to use protection from gangs. Y la solución, claro, es, es muy utópico, muy bonito abrir fronteras. Eh, la solución para mí es hay que trabajar en los países de destino, mm -hmm. de, and, de origen, perdón. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, the idea of open borders, it is a great idea, but we have to work with that. Tenemos que dar las condiciones mínimas de dignidad para que la gente no, no tenga que salir forzadamente. We need to give the minimum of dignity to all these people so they don't have to leave. I think um, there's an El Paso connection, so I'll answer that question. The, um, what we, I mean, we are witnessing a worldwide, as a, as a world community, we're in, we don't have the structures to deal with the, the phenomenon of migration today. Since we started collecting the numbers, um, we've, never, we've never seen levels of migration such that we're seeing today. Um, Naomi started the presentation by citing the figure that one in 113 folks, one out of one, every 113 folks, there are about 100 folks in this room, um, is an asylum seeker or refugee or internally displaced. Um, that's huge. That's like the population of, 
of, uh, I don't know, more than Italy, more than France, more than the United Kingdom. And that number's probably low. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so as a worldwide community, we just don't have the framework uh, to deal with it. And even at the United Nations and in the international framework, we start, we look at migration from the perspective first of legal migration, of which there's a huge number even. There's like 250 million, uh, million people in the world, like the size of the country of Brazil. Um, and then we sort of look at forced migration as a subset or as like a, the marginal population we, from the, inter, on the with the international framework. We need to flip the switch a little bit and realize that pe most migration is forced migration. And so we need to change that framework a little bit. And in the United States, absolutely the same uh, issue. Our asylum law, which is sort of a, a weird subspecies of international law because it's just different. We don't, we don't recognize that international framework, so we have our own asylum law, is also out of whack. It's antiquated. It was developed in the Cold War. Um, and as Ramon said, the people who are coming to the El Paso border, we're not granting asylum to anybody because it's so antiquated. Um, violence as a result of gang activity in which, for example, the Mexican government might be involved. <laughs> Um, you know, that type of forced migration from, my, uh, from Mexico or Central America as a result of Plan Merida. <laughs> we might be financing the Mexican government, which is causing forced migration in Mexico, which brings them to our border. We see that every time, all the time in El Paso. Those folks, they don't fit into any category because our, our system is antiquated and broken. So in El Paso, you have 1% of all asylum seekers are approved. 1%. And some people say, well, that's because you have so many Mexicans applying. And I don't know how to understand that except as racism. <laughs> I mean, that, that's really? Is it because they're all Mexicans? So we're not, we're not, is there a reason we can't recognize Mexican asylum seekers? Um, so there are structural inequities in our system. Our system is antiquated. And we do, we need to flip that switch. I don't know if it's open borders. I, I know that there's got to be greater recognition of the rights and dignity of migrants. We've got to get to that point internationally and nationally, we're not there. Um, and forced migration is a symptom of that. Um, so, so definitely we have to resolve that. Uh, thank you. I'd just like to remind people that the Trump administration has now lowered the cap um, for refugee admissions to I believe 45,000, which is the lowest it's been in many, many years. Um, and also as sort of the newest um, modification of the Muslim and refugee ban, um, they basically are now banning people from um, six Muslim majority countries, which happen to be for the most part the same countries that the US government has either bombed or threatening to bomb. Um, and then they have also said that for 11 countries, which they haven't announced what those countries are, but we can suspect that they're probably you know, the same countries more or less from, from the Muslim world, um, that pr pretty much the presumption is that there's not gonna be any refugees allowed from, from those countries in. Um, and that, you know, there's gonna be heightened, heightened um, sort of um, security mechanisms in place um, before, you know, deciding whether they can let anybody in from those countries or not, which, um, again, I think, you know, the connections between US foreign policy and the migration systems, and I mean the, the uh, policies on um, migration and uh, um, refugee policy are very, very clear. Just in this um, circumstance that, you know, the US created the conditions in the first place to force people to flee, and now US is not allowing people who are fleeing persecution because of those circumstances to come in. So, you know, we go back to where we started the conversation from, which I also would like this to be, I guess, my <laughs> final thought that, um, you know, we need to be talking about these issues, you know, in the same breath. We need to be um, holding the U.S. government accountable, not only to change its policy on immigration, but also its foreign policy. And, um, you know, as one mechanism to respond to your question, actually, on, you know, what can we as human rights advocates do to um, bring attention to, um, you know, to U.S. foreign policy, you know, perhaps one mechanism can be what I alluded to earlier, um, the use of people's tribunals, which have been in use uh, for many decades now. The first one was the Russell Tribunal um, that um, was aimed um, as, as a tool um, to um, bring attention to the crimes of the U.S. government in Vietnam. And
And ever since then, people's tribunals have been used around the world primarily to bring voice to the survivors of human rights violations who have had no other fora to, um, to basically um, express their, um, their grievances. Um, I've been now um, privileged to be part of um, several people's tribunals, including a people's tribunal international, uh, people of conscious tribunal on the Philippines um, that was organized by uh, Filipino activists, both here in the US and in the diaspora and in the Philippines, very well organized. And the point of that being to uh, basically um, draw a very clear picture of the crimes of the Philippines government in collaboration and in very much in support and facilitated by the US government as well. Um, and we heard from, I believe, 30 um, 30 Filipinos um, who testified to the to the jury about what they suffered, and um, and so I think you know that is something that can be replicated. Um, you know, you're talking about the Muslim ban. We had a People's Tribunal on the Muslim ban um, a few weeks ago in Atlanta, uh, and we put the Muslim ban on trial, and we heard from directly impacted people. So, um, so hopefully that is you know, just one mechanism that we as, um, as American human rights activists can resort to more and more. So I know Dylan has a bookend for us, so I'm just gonna ask him to share that bookend about the border mass and then uh, oh, yeah, we'll, that we'll border close mass. out. Um, yeah, I mean, the, um, just the other day I was commenting to Naomi, we celebrated the border mass in um, El Paso Ciudad Juarez, uh, which is a mass celebrated by folks on both sides of the border, uh, right there on the on the Rio Grande, and it got me thinking, um, you know, to the, uh, what what's really real when that takes place? As people of faith, right, we can ask ourselves this question, right? You know, we we talk about the building up of the body, right? What's really real, that body or that wall, or those political divisions or those conventions, or what's really real? It just gets you thinking, and we just have to be, think we've gotta be thinking about these issues with a new paradigm. We need alternative frameworks. Um, and so the border mass challenges us to think about that a little bit differently. I also wanna echo Ramon's call um, to get engaged as students, as professors, as faculty, as a university. Um, this is, we're going through really tough times right now with the Trump administration on the issue of immigration. Heightened enforcement, heightened border enforcement, heightened harassment, heightened, heightened intimidation of, of migrant communities, um, and it's terrible. Um, and it's having real practical effects on the lives of families. It's causing family separation. Uh, it's causing you know, um, depression, and I mean, it's, it's not good. But this could be one of the best gifts that we have, because we're gonna get to comprehensive immigration reform one day. And someone asked the question about social media, and I remember when Trump issued his Muslim ban um, not too long ago, for the first time on social media, I, I saw this connection that people made. There was a hashtag, no ban, no wall. Mm -hmm. Five years ago, if you had asked people about the wall, they might have said, why not? Both Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders had voted for the wall. But Trump forced us to sort of draw connections that we hadn't drawn before. Um, so there's a political opportunity here um, to bring this issue forward. Most Americans support comprehensive immigration reform. Most Americans oppose the wall. Most border residents support both of those things. Uh, comprehensive immigration law reform and don't support the wall. We have a political moment now to make these things front and center in the electoral process, and it's gonna demand that we all work together in new and unique ways, but we can do it. So clearly we could spend the entire day, three days, just <laughs> speaking about this topic. Uh, but I want to thank all of our panelists for being with us today and taking the time to fly in from all over the place to be with us here, uh, as well as for all of you being here. And I do urge that the conversations continue. So thank you very much to all of you. Thank you.